Okay, well this now brings us to my favorite part of the annual meeting where we recognize outstanding achievements by young researchers in medicine, engineering, science, and technology innovation. Uh, I think you're all going to be uh, pleased with what uh, they have to say today about what they've been doing and, and, and hopefully we'll all learn a little bit of something that's not maybe in our, in our own area of specialty of what's going on in some other areas of specialty. These awards play an important role in advancing TAMIS's goal of recognizing and promoting rising star researchers in the state. Over the years, I think it's 11 O'Donnell awardees have actually been uh, elected to one of the National Academies, um, and in part because of their recognition by TAMIS uh, for the work that they've, been do that they've done. The awards are named in honor of Edith and Peter O'Donnell, who have been steadfast supporters of TAMIST since its inception and are among the state's staunchest advocates for excellence in higher education and research. They're supported through the O'Donnell Endowment, and we'd like to acknowledge and thank the O'Donnell Endowment donors for their generous contributions to this endowment. The awards committee is composed of 12 TAMIS members serving on four subcommittees, one for each of the awards, um, and a committee chair. Those of you who are still awake and who do math pretty quickly in your head will understand that there are only 12 of us listed up there, even though I just said there are 13 of us, um, 12, uh, three for each of the four subcommittees plus a chair. Well, I'm the chair, but I also serve on one of the committees as well, so there's only 12 of us. Uh, for the 2020 awards, there were a total of 54 nominations, 23 of which were renominations, people who were nominated previously and are still on the list again. This is a very competitive award to win. Subcommittees select finalists to advance to the external review stage where National Academy members outside of Texas review the finalists' materials and submit their comments. This is one of the ways that we support getting knowledge of the wonderful research that's being done in Texas to people outside of Texas who may not be quite as well aware of it. Uh, the Technology Innovation Committee works in a slightly different way, but I won't go into that. Uh, the majority of award recipients have been nominated in previous years. Uh, after a thorough review of the candidates through this peer review process from people outside of Texas, the individual subcommittees come to the awards committee and justify their selections and often in the awards committee we help the subcommittees actually come to their conclusions. It is a real tough operation to pick a winner in any of these subcommittee can candidates. The awards are then submitted to a Nobel Laureates Committee chaired by Joseph Goldstein, who again reviews the recommendations and approves them before they're submitted to the board for final approval. Uh, so far, the uh, Nobel Committee has not disagreed with anything that the awards committee has done but they have the right to do so, as does the Board of Directors. So we have to be very careful when we do our work. We'd like to thank all of the various committees and the Nobel Laureate Committee members for participating these years. Uh, the, these years. Each of the medals has a distinct pattern reflective of the discipline, and these awards are presented to the recipients at the annual O'Donnell Awards dinner, which will be tonight. As chair of the committee, I am proud to announce the 2020 O'Donnell Award recipients in order of their presentations, and I will be calling them up one by one. But for the category of medicine is Dr. Susan Best Frost of UT Health uh, San Antonio. For engineering, Dr. Jeffrey Reimer, University of Houston. For science, Dr. Alessandra Corsi, Texas Tech University. And for technology innovation, there it's two co-winners, Dr. Christine Kaiswetter and 
Dr. Deepak Kilpati. Our first presentation will be by Dr. Bess Froster. She is an assistant professor at the Sam and Ann Barship Institute of Longevity and Managing Studies uh, at UT Health San Antonio. Dr. Frost's pioneering research in Alzheimer's disease focuses on what causes the disease in an effort to slow its progression and save cognitive functions on patients. Discoveries from Dr. Frost have opened new avenues of study in Alzheimer's research to utilize medication early on in disease progression to stave off negative cognitive effects, preventing memory loss and giving patients a better quality of life. As I age, I find that this is much more important to me, and uh, I want to tell everybody whose names uh, of people I've met in the last 24 hours who I will probably forget your name, I want to apologize now and, 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 and pledge that as soon as Dr. Frost uh, develops a pill that I can take, uh, I'll take it and I'll do a better job of remembering everybody's names. So uh, Dr. Frost, please come up. We'll have questions and answers after the presentation. Thank you. Is there a clicker? Is there a clicker? I don't know. No. <laughs> so I'm Bess, and I work on Alzheimer's disease. Um, I need a clicker. Um, I'll just go ahead and get right in while they're hopefully bringing me the clicker. So Alzheimer's disease is the only disorder in the top 10 causes of death in the United States that does not currently have a method of prevention or a therapy that actually slows or cures the disease. In Texas, um, the incidence of Alzheimer's disease is expected to increase by 25% over the next five years. So this is a big problem for people and for the economy. All right. So there are currently five FDA-approved drugs for Alzheimer's disease. Um, most of these, or all of these drugs actually, are just trying to boost neurotransmitters in the brain. They are very symptomatic. They're, they're treating the consequences of the disease. They don't slow down the disease, and they don't target the actual disease process. They don't work in all individuals, and for the people who they do show some cognitive benefit uh, from these drugs, they don't show the benefit for very long. So I believe that in order to treat the disease process, we have to understand the disease process. We have to know what happens in a healthy brain that causes it to develop and then suffer the consequences of Alzheimer's disease. So in a post-mortem human brain, the, pathologi the neuropathological hallmarks of the disease are the tau tangles and the amyloid beta plaques. So while the tau tangles are most infamous for their role alongside the plaques in Alzheimer's disease, they also appear in many other neurodegenerative disorders besides Alzheimer's disease in the absence of any plaques. They correlate very, very closely with areas of the brain that show cognitive deficits and areas of the brain that actually undergo neurodegeneration. We also know that dysfunction of the tau protein is sufficient to cause disease because mutations in the tau gene cause familial frontotemporal dementias. So just having pathological forms of tau is sufficient to give you a neurodegenerative disorder. So because of these reasons, my lab focuses on tau and how tau kills neurons. Historically, a lot of the therapeutic effort for drug development has been on um, uh, the amyloid plaques, and as you probably know, there have been a lot of failures, or all of, they've all been failures, actually, uh, for drug development for Alzheimer's disease. So we're trying a, a different tack. We're focusing on the tau itself. So there's been a lot of effort also in terms of tau biology in trying to understand how normal forms of tau, which are normally bound to microtubules in the, in the cell, how they become pathological. So we know that tau gets put, modified um, as a protein. It has uh, aberrant phosphorylation sites and acetylation. Um, and there's a lot of drug development centered around uh, trying to stop bad tau from forming and also trying to clear out the bad tau once it has formed. 
So I think this is a reasonable uh, uh, approach to drug development, and I've participated in some of these things during my um, past research. But the reality is that once someone is diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease or another tauopathy, once they are showing cognitive symptoms, we now know that they've had decades of tau accumulation in their brain. So I think that trying to target the tau that's already been in the brain for, t for you know, over 20 years, it might be too late to get rid of that bad protein. And instead, it's important to understand the things that that tau is doing inside the brain that could be affecting that person at that point in time. And that's what my lab is focusing on. We're trying to figure out how tau kills brain cells. And we think that these, um, that these additional nodes, if we understand these nodes, are additional targets for therapy. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that work. The systems that we work in are fruit fly models of, tauopathy, of Alzheimer's disease and related tauopathies, uh, mouse models of tauopathy, as well as postmortem human brain and fluids that we get from patients. So in my earlier work, I had found that one of the things that pathological forms of tau do in the cell is disrupt the way the DNA is packaged. So DNA is not, it's not all floppy like a noodle inside of, your nucle inside of the nucleus. There are certain areas of, of DNA that are very, very tightly wound up and there are certain areas of DNA that are more open. So I found that tau causes the areas that are supposed to be very, very tightly wound up to become kind of unfolded. This type of DNA is called constitutive heterochromatin. So I have a picture here of an example of a chromosome. This type of very tightly wound up DNA is present um, at the centromere in the middle of the chromosome to help it stay together, as well as the ends of the, of the chromosome, the telomeres. And this type of DNA is, doesn't have very many genes in it. It's very repetitive. And the genes that are located in this type of very tightly wound up DNA are not usually expressed at very high levels. When I was doing this work, what I found most interesting was that this type of DNA is very enriched for transposable elements. That's, what, that's the project that I'm gonna tell you about today. So what are transposable elements? They were discovered by Barbara McClintock. She was the first woman to ever win the Nobel Prize in physiology or medicine for her discovery of transposons. They're pieces of DNA that can move from one place to another in the genome. So they come in two different flavors. First, the retrotransposons. These are pieces of DNA that are transcribed into RNA. That RNA is, is protein coding, so it encodes the information that that RNA needs to become reverse transcribed back into another DNA copy. So that there's an, another DNA copy of that piece of DNA. And then that DNA can insert back into the genome in a new location. The other type of transposable elements are the DNA transposons. Instead of making a copy of themselves, they actually hop from one place to another. So when I first learned about transposons when I was in high school, I thought that they were a genetic oddity of corn. That was where Dr. McClintock had made her original discovery. And I was really excited to find out how much of the human genome is made up of this type of DNA. So when you, when you first learn, you learn about the genome, you hear about the genes. The genes are actually only encoded, the genes, the normal genes, are actually only encoded by about 25% of the human genome. And the proteins are only coming from the exons, which is about 2%. That's what most people are focusing on when, when they're thinking about cell biology. Another quarter of the genome is made up of very repetitive structural DNA. And the rest of the genome, half of the human genome, is made up of transposable elements. I was floored when I learned about this, and I still can't believe that more people are not working on this in the context of disease. So of that 45% of, of the human genome that's transposable element, only about 2% are the hoppers, the ones that just cut themselves out and then jump to a new location. And most of those in the human genome are not able to actually move anymore. So we don't focus on that type of DNA, of transposon um, in the lab. The rest are the retrotransposons, the one that make an RNA copy, turn back into DNA, and then that inserts somewhere else. So let's say tau, causes activation of these elements, which I'll show you in a few minutes that it does, why would we care if these types of elements were activated in a disease context? So whenever the, the transposon jumps into a new location, that's a new mutation. And if that transposon jumps into an area of a genome that's important for a certain gene expression, a, gene, a certain gene to be expressed, you could have detrimental effects. So there are new mutations that, that arise because of this transposon activation. The DNA, if there is DNA present, 
that is not inserted back into the genome, it's just out in the open, the cell can recognize it as a viral DNA and mount an antiviral response against its own, its own DNA. This happens similarly with the RNA that arises from retrotransposons. Whenever the genes are transcribed into RNA, they're often transcribed in both directions. So you get an RNA, two copies that come together and make a double-stranded RNA that's recognized as viral. That RNA is protein coding, and it makes proteins that are very similar to viruses. It's actually thought that the reason why um, organisms have these retrotransposons is because of ancient infections uh, with exogenous viruses that just got stuck in our genome and the genomes of almost every other organism. So the first thing that we did in the lab, whenever we, th when I started my own lab and we thought that transposable elements may have a role um, in Alzheimer's disease and associated tauopathies, was take our fly model of Alzheimer's disease and ask if just the first step in retrotrans, sorry, the first step in retrotransposon activation, the RNA, if these were different in the normal flies and the tau transgenic, human tau transgenic flies. So we identified all of the retrotransposons that were elevated as a consequence of pathogenic tau. We wanted to know if this was relevant to human disease, so we took RNA sequencing data from, that was available through the AMP-AD project from human patients uh, that were either healthy control brains, um, Alzheimer's disease brains, or one of these other tauopathies that's where you have tau deposition, but you don't have any, any plaques. Um, this data was generated by the lab of Nilu Fertainer at the Mayo Clinic. So when we analyzed this data, we found a bunch of retrotransposons, similar to what we had found in the fly, that were also elevated in these two tauopathies. So you'll see a lot of these that are elevated start with HERV. That stands for human endogenous retrovirus. These elements are so similar to exogenous retroviruses, like HIV, that they're called endogenous retroviruses. So we went back to the fly model and we used a reporter of transposable element jumping. We wanted to know if, if, so we had already established that the RNA levels were elevated. We want to know if there were actual novel insertions that were happening that would cause new mutations in the genome. So we had control and tau transgenic flies and we use this fluorescent reporter. Whenever you get a mobilization event, when you get a new insertion, you get green fluorescence. So you can see in the control flies, fly brains, this is the adult brain, there's a low level of reporter expression in the control that is significantly increased in the tau transgenic flies, suggesting that not only are the, RNA, are the RNAs of retrotransposons elevated, but they're actually jumping in an adult brain. We saw that this was age dependent. So at day one of adulthood, we don't see any transposable element jumping. By ten, day 10 of adulthood, which is also whenever we start to see neurodegeneration in this model, you can see transposable element jumping based on looking at the green fluorescent protein levels. And this is sustained in older flies as well throughout life. We've recently taken an approach, and this is not published, to see if there are are that the retrotransposon jumping is actually happening in the human patients. The data that I showed you a few slides ago was just the, the RNA levels. So we wanted to know if there were extra DNA copies in human uh, brains of patients with Alzheimer's disease. So um, we reasoned that if there's activation of retrotransposons, there should be increased DNA copy number of these elements. We took uh, post-mortem human brain samples, and we isolated just the nucleus from those cells. We created a nanostring code set that lets us um, detect DNA levels of a bunch of different candidate retrotransposons that we thought might be active. And we were really excited to see in late-stage Alzheimer's disease that the ones in red up here at the top are the ones that are significant, that there are a few retrotransposons that do show increased DNA copy number in the disease brain. We were very excited about this because most of these elements are not thought to have mobilization potential anymore. Um, we then asked if we could go a little bit earlier in the disease process. What if we, what if we look at patients with, um, that are at a stage of the disease where they have some changes in the brain but they don't actually show any cognitive symptoms? So we were very surprised to find that at early stage Alzheimer's disease, almost every single 
transposable element on our list was elevated at the DNA level, suggesting that there is massive activation of retrotransposons in human Alzheimer's disease brain, and it's happening at an early point. Um, so we think that it's very toxic um, to people's brains when they have this level of activation at such an early stage, and these cells that, that have this increase in, in DNA copy number are dying by the time that we are looking at a late stage Alzheimer's disease brain. So we wanted to know if this transposon activation was targetable. We used a drug that's FDA approved for HIV and hepatitis B. It's an antiretroviral drug. It blocks this step right here where the RNA is being turned into DNA. And we fed it to the tau transgenic flies. So if you look at the second panel here, we're comparing um, flies that were just fed vehicle, which is water, versus fed, uh, flies that were fed the, um, the HIV drug. And we saw, based on this fluorescent reporter of transposable element jumping, that there's less jumping whenever we feed the drug to the flies. More importantly, we found that the drug suppresses neurodegeneration in this model. So in control flies, we don't, uh, we don't usually see any neuronal death or brain cell death at this time point. We saw no toxicity with the drug at this time point. Uh, the Alzheimer's disease model has a significant amount of brain cell death by this age, but the flies that are fed this drug have significantly less drugs. So they have, we, this told us that transposable element activation is targetable. So we've been thinking recently about how to design a um, clinical trial to target this process. So we're thinking now about whether to go forward with a clinical trial with the drugs that we already have, which we know are not perfect, but we know that they're safe in people. Um, we're also thinking about, we're working with a team, the Neurodegeneration Consortium at MD Anderson, um, which is led by Jim Ray, uh, about making novel reverse transcriptase inhibitors that hit the endogenous retroviruses. Um, antiretroviral therapy is currently in, tr in clinical trials for ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease as well as um, Acardi Gutierrez syndrome, so there's definitely precedent for using these types of drugs to treat a neurodegenerative disorder. We've been working to develop biomarkers that are going to allow us to identify patients who have high, uh, uh, where we can tell that they have high levels of retrotransposon activation in cerebrospinal fluid or blood. Um, that's being led uh, by Gabby Zuniga, an MD-PhD student in my lab. Um, in terms of, of patient selection, we would work with neuropsychologists to do cognitive testing. Um, and then we also have the ability at UT Health to do um, tau. We will soon have the ability to do imaging of tau in brains of people while they're still alive. So these would be candidates um, who would be uh, appropriate for the trial. We've worked with Marty Yavers um, at UT Health to determine the blood-brain penetrance of the HIV drug that we've been working with. Um, and in terms of drug efficacy, it's already been shown that antiretroviral therapy is, um, that it decreases the inflammatory profile in plasma from patients. This is consistent with an effect, um, with the fact that these endogenous retroviruses are very inflammatory. So if you stop them from becoming activated, you can decrease inflammation. Um, we would check to see if the markers of retrotransposon activation were decreased in blood and plasma as well, and we do neuropsychological testing. All right, so I didn't have time to tell you everything that we're doing. This is just kind of, um, we've, we've used the FLY model to, uh, to really figure out the mechanism that links tau to retrotransposon activation. We're doing other things, uh, many other things in the lab. For example, we've uh, been working on how the effects of tau on the nuclear architecture affect how RNA gets in and out of a cell. We have also found another drug that blocks this aspect. Um, so we're kind of just you know, working along and identifying novel targets for therapy. This is my lab. Uh, most of the retrotransposon work was driven by a postdoc in my lab, Wen Yin Sun. Um, I'd also like to thank um, my external collaborators who pro provide a lot of uh, mouse, um, mouse brain tissue for us that I didn't have time to show you. All of my funding that starred uh, is supporting the trans different aspects of the tau and transposable element project. So thank you very much. <laughs> questions? Okay. All right. And I have time for questions. Yes.
So you, you have a whole generation of HIV positive individuals that have been on retroviral vi viral therapy probably during a period when they would have been developing Alzheimer's disease. Has anybody gone, started to go back and take a look at the epidemiology of that population and see whether there's any long-term effect of that retroviral viral therapy? Um, so I was recently at a working group meeting at NIH that's focused on um, retro, retrotransposon activation and neurodegenerative disorders. And there is someone that has done that, and it is not published yet. And I can't say anything else about it, but I'm excited for the results. <laughs> uh, John Cook, Houston Methodist. Uh, that was a beautiful presentation, really exciting work. Um, does the ability of the retrotransposons to jump around, um, does that, is there anything, uh, are they inhibited by the chromatin configuration? In other words, is there, in a closed chromatin configuration, is it less likely for those retrotransposons retro to be active? Yes, absolutely. That's actually what got us to start working on the retrotransposons in the first place. Because, so the cell has two um, main ways in which it keeps these elements off. Um, first, like you said, is that they're packaged in DNA that's very, very tightly wound up. The second are a type of small RNA. They're kind of like microRNAs. They're called peewee interacting RNAs that post-transcriptionally silence uh, transposable element RNA. So we found that pathogenic forms of tau disrupt both arms of retrotransposon silencing. Not only does tau cause those, that heterochromatin to open up, uh, but it depletes the pi RNA pool. So yeah, both arms are, are disrupted by tau. We think that those arms are actually connected to each other. But. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Mm -hmm. OK. Oh. All right, one more. One more. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Beautiful presentation. Hong Zhao Ouyang, Texas A&M. I just wonder, those pathogenic uh, tangled tau protein, um, does, it, does the protein, the misfolding or malfolding protein tau, cause any ER stress? Or do you see any ER stress it only play a role in pathogenesis of uh, the Alzheimer's disease? ER stress? Yes. Yes, it has Endoplasmic been. Endoplasmic reticulum stress. Yes, so t pathogenic forms of tau do cause ER stress. Um, one aspect of a lab that I did not touch on at all is um, how tau affects protein um, RNA quality control and translation. Um, so we're seeing elevated levels of translation in the, the lab models. And we're not working on ER stress, but it's related. Yeah. Because chronic ER stress can cause um, apoptosis of cells. So this phenomenon may be relevant in neuron death in mm -hmm. this condition. Thank you. Yes. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much.